Ever since Pedro Delgado first entered the Tour de France in 1983, he dreamed of becoming only the third Spanish cyclist ever to win. That dream was fulfilled in 1988. He won by a stunning seven minutes ahead of the Dutchman, Steven Rooks. Everything seemed perfect for Delgado, but his dream turned into a nightmare when he was accused of taking dope. At the finish in Paris, he declared his innocence and said he would take his revenge in 1989. The 1989 tour opens with a prologue time trial in the city of Luxembourg. It's only five miles long, and each of the 196 starters has to climb the steep Habiberberg Hill on the inner city circuit. Start time arrives for Delgado, the defending champion. But where is he? He's throwing away time even before the tour has begun, and in panic he arrives. Climbs the start ramp, and two minutes and 40 seconds later, races away along the Avenue de la Liberté in Luxembourg. With the adrenaline pumping through his body, Delgado is racing fast, and he makes nothing of the hill's difficult 10% grade. Ahead of him, Greg Lamond is also moving well. The 1986 winner is returning to top form. Finally, he can forget his near-fatal shooting accident in 1987. Le Monde is hoping he can finish this tour in the top 20. It's the fourth best time in a shade over 10 minutes. This race against the clock is also a moment of truth for Laurent Fignon. Since winning the tour in 1983 and 84, the Frenchman's form has been erratic. He too has had surgery for tendonitis. And last year, a tapeworm forced him to quit the race before halfway. He finishes runner-up in the prologue, an eye wink faster than Le Monde. Besides Fignon and Le Monde, there are many other pretenders to Delgado's crown. One is the young Dutchman, Eric Brekink. He finished third to Fignon in the recent Tour of Italy, and he believes he can do even better in the Tour de France. In his steady, power-packed style, Brekink is riding faster than anyone in this prologue. Straight as a die, he spins down the avenue to stop the clock at 9 minutes, 54.57 seconds, the best time. Meanwhile, Delgado is racing as hard as he knows to make up time. He's still not aware of his actual loss, but after he finishes with a time of 10 minutes and 8 seconds, the judges will add on a 2 minutes, 40 seconds late start. And this puts him dead last in the standings, almost three minutes behind the first yellow jersey of the race, Eric Brekink. The opening road race next morning makes a scenic loop of the Moselle Valley before returning to the start point in Luxembourg City. The 84-mile stage doesn't produce much action, except for an early attack by two riders. The two riders are Cassio da Silva of Portugal and Soren Lilholt of Denmark both of whom have families in Luxembourg. Lilholt manages to stay with Da Silva until the final climb into the city, where the Portuguese finally leaves him. Two minutes behind the leaders, Delgado puts in a similar attack up the Pavayaberg Hill, just to remind everyone he's still full of fight. But it's Da Silva who rolls down the Avenue of Liberté to score a popular stage win over Soren Lilholt.
And with his two minute advantage, Da Silva also takes over the race lead. Later that day, there's another race against the clock, a team time trial. Fignon directs his Super U squad on their aerodynamic bikes to the best time, 53 minutes and 48 seconds for the 28 and a half miles. But Delgado is in trouble again. He can't even keep up with his Reynolds teammates. They have to wait for him and consequently record the slowest time. Four minutes, 41 seconds behind the winner. Unbelievable, but true. This is the ADR team of Le Monde, however. They're racing faster than expected. Le Monde, number 141, receives great support from his Dutch and Belgium teammates. The team comes in fifth. The PDM team contains four of the other race favorites, Dutchman Steven Rux and Gert Jan Ternisse, Mexican Raoul Alcala and the Irishman Sean Kelly. They take fourth place. For the tour's two-day presence in this beautiful city, the Luxembourgers paid the organizers $1.3 million. And now the race is heading for Belgium on a twisting course through the hilly Ardennes to the motoring circuit at Spa. Squeezing between medieval houses, the pack climbs the steepest hill of the day at Viandon, 30 miles into the stage. But with 120 miles to go, the riders stay together. At noon, the race finally leaves Luxembourg. It was in these windswept parts that Patton's army defeated the Nazis in the Battle of the Bulge. But today's battling cyclists only seek shelter from the wind, not bullets, as they race towards Spa. First down the hill into Spa's racetrack is Alcala of the PDM team. He's broken away from a break of six that developed 16 miles earlier. And with his teammates controlling the pace of the main pack, Alcala joyously becomes the first Mexican ever to win a stage of the Tour de France. Yesterday, the Tour lost its first rider, a Colombian, and stage four, starting in Liège, may provide more casualties. Delgado, who's already lost seven minutes, is worried he'll lose even more time on the rough cobblestone roads that await him near the end of this marathon stage. Rattling over cobblestones at speeds of 30 miles an hour is an acrobatic exercise. Some riders fall and need wheels replaced by helpers from their team cars dust gets into the rider's lungs as well. But still the speed of the race is relentless. The battle intensifies near the end. Even yellow jersey Da Silva is up there. But another rider breaks clear. It's Yellow Nydam, a Dutchman who's known for his finishing speed. And he gets the stage victory to add to the one he won in nearby Lieva a year ago. Dane Jens Vegerby, he lost 12 minutes. Da Silva receives another yellow jersey. But he'll almost certainly lose the lead on stage five, an individual time trial in the west of France. Delgado prepares for this race of truth. His special time trial bike has aerodynamic disc wheels and high gears. The Spaniard starts in the calm, sunny morning. Perfect conditions for a time trial. Delgado is one of the earliest starters as the back markers start first and he's almost 10 minutes behind Da Silva on overall time. The race leaders include Fignon and Le Monde and they won't start for another four hours yet. Delgado's disc wheels slice through the still air. He puts every ounce of strength into going quickly. Thirteen miles into his effort, Delgado races past fishing boats in the ancient port of Dinan. He then crosses a narrow medieval bridge and heads into the hills. The crowds lining the short climbs realize that Delgado is riding faster than any of the earlier starters. He covers the first 14 miles in less than 30 minutes. Already, he's more than a minute better than anyone else. The finish is in Rennes, the capital of the Brittany region, and the sun is still shining as Delgado races into town just after midday. He's blasted through the second part of this time trial at almost 30 miles an hour. His time is one hour, 38 minutes, 36 seconds, the best time by four minutes. 
two hours after Delgado finished, a rainstorm blows in. The PDM team Sean Kelly suffers in the worsening conditions and he will lose five minutes to Delgado. Everyone now focuses on French favourite Fignon. His fans expect him to take over the race leadership today. Despite the rain and the strengthening wind, Fignon has chosen to use two disc wheels, which makes a bike hard to control in the crosswind. Fignon detests the rain as it fogs up his glasses, yet he still rides with power. Even so, at the 30-mile time check, he's 90 seconds slower than Delgado. Fignon continues fighting hard. He has weathered the worst of the storm. He's picking up time. And he crosses the finish line in a time of one hour, 39 minutes and eight seconds. 32 seconds back of Delgado. Preparing for his vital test, Le Mans has a secret weapon, a set of aerodynamic handlebars never before used in the Tour de France. He's feeling strong and determined as he prepares to leave the start ramp at Dinar. Le Mans feels relaxed on his new bars, which support his elbows and bring his body into a more streamlined profile. By halfway, Le Monde has caught and passed the rider, prologue winner, Brekink. Le Monde is already 100 yards ahead of the Dutchman. For the first time in three years, Le Monde is operating at full power. His wheels are turning like a locomotive's. Even so, over the final 14 miles, he has to make up 64 seconds on Delgado. He gets back into the tuck position for the final sprint. The American causes a sensation. He has won the stage and the yellow jersey. On the next stage to Futuroscope, Le Monde has new responsibilities. His ADR team now must ride with him at the head of the pack, maintaining a strong tempo to discourage breakaways. And when the pace eases, it's the Frenchman, Joel Pellier, who makes a solo break, even though there's more than 100 miles to go. It's the ADR team who have to start the chase. And amongst the fallers, Frenchman Ronan Pensek on the right, who will lose 10 minutes. Even the yellow jersey is active in the later attacks behind Pellier, but despite a sudden storm before the finish, Pellier, who was 10 minutes behind Le Monde overnight, wins the stage by a minute, as the rain beats down on the geometric buildings of the Futuroscope theme park. Le Monde and his men have another rough day in front of them on stage seven, 160 miles to Bordeaux. It's not a pleasant prospect to set out in heavy rain knowing there's seven hours of riding in front of you. But the miserable conditions don't deter 13 riders from attacking. There's a fierce chase and another crash. Kelly has fallen with teammate Raul Alcala. The Mexican has cracked a rib, but he will catch up with the pack again. There are many attacks, but the Belgian Etienne de Wilde is the winner at Bordeaux. The hilly eighth stage takes place in the Armagnac wine area. Starting outside a famed chapel, Our Lady of the Cyclists, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary. Fignon and race leader Le Mans briefly share the podium with the chapel's priest. After receiving his blessing, the pack pedals away through the vineyards. After 40 miles, a breakaway group of four moves ahead. They work hard together and just stay clear of the pack until Po. Where Irishman Martin Early, a teammate of Kelly, phlegmatically wins the stage from French champion Eric Caritou and Michael Wilson of Australia. There's no change in the overall positions, and Le Monde will wear the yellow jersey into the next day's much awaited mountain stage. There are three mountain passes to climb the 3,400 foot Marie Blanc, 5,600 feet Obisque, and the final hall to the 4,300 feet Cam Basque. Smaller chain wheels and sprockets are fitted to the riders' bikes. They'll need lower gears to tackle the steep gradients that lie ahead. This beautiful race into the Pyrenees Mountains will be a rude test for Le Monde. Will he be able to stay with the mountain goats like Delgado? In the early stages, the Americans on the 7-Eleven team set the pace. They're hoping for a good performance today from their leader, Andy Hampston but their presence also gives moral support for Le Monde.
Two riders break clear after 16 miles, Robert Forrest of France and Dutchman Adrie van der Poel. They work well together and gain three minutes before the Marie Blanc. On the climb, Forrest has problems with his bike, leaving van der Poel to continue alone. Forrest switches to a spare machine. And after three more bike changes, Forrest rejoins his Dutch companion a mile before the summit. But behind there are problems for Forrest Fagor team leader Stephen Roach. Irishman Roach is returning from injury after winning the Tour de France in 1987. Today he's hit his injured knee and is fighting the pain of the climb with teammate Paul Kimmage alongside. As sweat drips from his nose, Roach loses ground. He'll concede 10 minutes today and pull from the race tomorrow. Meanwhile, Forrest continues his charge in front. He drops Van der Poel. And then races towards the summit alone in front of enormous crowd. As the Tour Radio reports, the Packers split with a small group being led by the tall, thin Turnisa. The short Swiss Bayard Breuil, Fignon, Kelly in green and Le Monde in yellow, of course. The leaders head now towards the second climb, the Col de Bisque, where Forrest is caught by a lone chaser who quickly leaves the Frenchman to his fate. And the man now in the lead, it's the Spaniard Miguel Indurain, a rising star of Spanish cycling and a devoted team lieutenant for Delgado. Indurain climbs the 10 mile Longo Beast with great confidence, more than two minutes in front of the pack. Eager riders, headed here by Jerome Simon of Team Z, launch a counter attack. But Ternisa, leading the second group in the distance, sets a steady tempo to keep the race together. In front, Indurain continues his solo towards the misshrouded summit of the Obisque, nearly 6,000 feet above sea level. The fans have been waiting here since dawn. The wait has been worthwhile. As he crests the long climb, Indurain grabs a newspaper from a fan and stuffs it up his racing jersey to counter the cold air on the rapid descent below. The 25-year-old Spaniard in the Basque country is one of the most skillful descenders in the world and he reaches speeds of 60 miles an hour on this spectacular drop to the valley. When Hampston leads the main pack into the town of Argelay-Gazost, after the 15 miles of descending, Indurain has taken his lead to over six minutes. Only 13 miles remain in this stage, but it's nearly all uphill to the final peak, the Cam Basque. On the long gradual climb up the valley of the Coteray, the leader stays cool, despite knowing that the pack is chasing hard and that several individuals are closing quickly. Fignon's teammate, Gerard Rouet, sets the pace for his leader, with Le Mans tucked in behind them both. Indurain reaches Coteray, where the grade steepens for the final three miles haul to the finish. His fatigue causes him to fluff a gear change but the young Spaniard quickly recovers. Behind, Fignon is feeling strong and contemplates an attack on Le Monde. The Frenchman need only make up five seconds to take the yellow jersey. Also in the group are Hampston of 7-Eleven, Rooks and Kelly of PDM, and in sunglasses, the Canadian hope Steve Bauer. But Fignon is beaten to the punch by Delgado. The defending champion has finally reached his beloved mountains and sprints away. The others can't follow, but Le Monde is very pleased to still be in the company of Fignon, Rooks and the other top climbers. He is passing his first mounting test with great distinction. And so is Delgado, who's showing his Spanish fans the same aggressive style he showed a year ago.
And up in front, his teammate Indurain successfully completes his brave 60 miles solo to take his first ever stage win in the Tour de France. And 90 seconds later, Delgado comes charging over the crest of the Cambasque Hill, knowing that he's finally starting to eat away at his huge deficit. But after he crosses the line, only 26 seconds tick by before the surprising Kelly leads home the group with Fignon and Le Monde. The American's yellow jersey survives another day. The race remained in the Pyrenees on stage 10, four giant mountain climbs, including the Col de Tourmalet at 7,000 feet and ending with 6,000 feet up the Super Bagnères climb above Luchon. With an afternoon start in Cauteret, the sun is already at its hottest. The heat will make the climb seem even tougher. The pack rolls gently out of town. Before one of the gendarmes holds aloft a French trickler to give the official race start. Everyone is nervous, especially the drivers of the team's technical support cars who seek their correct spot in the following caravan. Soon the pack settles into a steady rhythm, riding through deep gorges and past fields where the hay is being harvested. The stage is only 42 minutes old when the real climbing begins and a breakaway group forms immediately, led by the second French favourite, Charlie Motte of the RMO team. In the break also with Motte is the red-shirted Swiss champion Pascal Richard and the Scottish climber Robert Miller. Delgado's Reynolds team controls the pack to limit the advantage of the escape. Where the ponytailed Miller takes charge too, he was crowned King of the Mountains in the 1984 Tour de France and his relentless style soon has Richard struggling. With three miles of the Tourmalet still remaining, the Swiss champion is dropped. There are no second chances on such a long difficult climb and Richard is gobbled up by the pursuing field. Delgado still has his teammates alongside him, while Rooks, Kelly, Le Monde, Alcala and Hampston are following comfortably. But Fignon is struggling near the back. Miller's speed at the front of the break is relentless, and Motte can only follow in his wake. The chase is also strong and relentless with Delgado's blonde-haired teammate, Julian Jorospe, doing the bulk of the work. And Miller and Motte can't push their lead beyond a minute. It's proving a magnificent tussle. Delgado, Rooks, Turnisser and Le Monde are proving the strongest of the race favourites. Miller is still the stronger of the two leaders as they near the top of the 7,000 foot summit. Motte grabs a newspaper in preparation for the drop. With two of the race's most dangerous men up front, the pursuit behind is relentless. As the riders have to stand on the pedals when the grade gets steeper and steeper. In the early part of this century, when these mountain roads were unpaved, the tall men were forced to walk over these summits. Endurance and stamina were the keys to success in those days. Speed and anaerobic fitness are now more important.
And today it's Miller who's proving the fittest. Scott crosses the summit of the Col de Tourmalet ahead of Motte. Half a minute behind, another ex-king of the mountains, Lucho Herrera of Colombia, bursts from the group and Ternisa goes with him. And it's the lanky Dutchman who wins this particular jury. There are still 20 or so men in the front group. The other 170 are scattered down the mountainside. And 18 of them won't even survive this destructive day. Seeking to gain every precious second, Miller crouches like a downhill skier as he zooms down the Col de Tourmalet with Motte. This a breakaway in true tour tradition. The two leaders extend their lead to a minute by the valley town of San Marie de Campan. This is where the counterattacks are coming thick and fast. After his teammate Gorospe takes a flyer, Delgado himself breaks clear of the Le Mans group. It's a conceived plan, and quickly he joins his fellow Spaniard. Gorospe does all of the pacemaking for his leader as they gain ground with every stroke of their pedals. But Le Monde is coming in pursuit, but not even Rooks will help the American chase after Delgado. while Fignon, well, he's struggling in another group 200 yards behind. They eventually close the gap, but only after a hard struggle. And when the two groups merge, the pace slows dramatically. It looks as though Delgado's escape is proving successful. Once the day's second climb begins, Delgado races away from the faithful Gorospe. His job is done, and he drops back to the pack. Launched so well into the lead, Delgado soon bridges the gap up to the two breakaways. The most important move of the race so far is now underway. The most dangerous move too, to depose Greg Lamond as leader of the tour. With this climb, the Aspen and two others to come, the riders in the main group seem afraid to commit themselves to an all-out chase. Rook sets a steady tempo, but the teammates of Motte, Miller and Delgado try now to disrupt the efforts. Their tactics work, the pace slows and many riders who are dropped on the tourmalet are back in the group. But there's no slackening of the pace in the front, Delgado, Motte, and the remarkable Miller are focused on the finish still 40 miles away. They cross the Aspen summit.
and plunge towards the next valley at breakneck speed. Back on the mountain, the crowds wait more than two minutes before the Le Mans group comes into sight. They cross the summit exactly two minutes, 17 seconds after Miller, Motte and Delgado. The leaders gain even more on the descent and they reach the feed zone at Arrow for the four minutes to the good. Miller grabs his food bag and restocks his pockets, knowing that he'll need every last ounce of energy on the two climbs which lie still ahead. The Scotsman again makes the pace up the third climb, the Perisord, taking the trio farther and farther in front. When the now 60-strong pack appears, the gap has increased to almost five minutes. And so Motte, who was only four minutes, nine seconds down on the Mond overnight, becomes the new leader of the tour, on the road at least. It's no wonder the French fans are happy, and they shout encouragement to Motte as the leaders approach the Pair of Swords summit. Once again, the man who's first over the top, Robert Miller. They always refer to Robert Miller as the man of the Pyrenees. He has twice won in these mountains, his first ever stage win in the Tour de France in 1984, coming after the descent into Luchon. Now, ironically, he'll finish on a mountain top high above Luchon, the Col de Superbannière. These three riders were creating the most damage since the Tour de France started in the city of Luxembourg. After that marvellous time trial in the west of France, Delgado is now trying to hammer home his next advantage, his climbing ability in the Pyrenees. He was doing it in front of a mainly Spanish crowd down on the borders in the far south of France. While Rooks and Ternisa sprint from the pack to gain more King of the Mountains points ahead of yesterday's hero, Miguel Indurain. As the break passes through the streets of Luchon, the leaders drop now to four minutes. Motte and Miller have now led the stage for almost three hours and they still have to tackle another 4,000 feet of climbing to the finish at Superbannière. A counter-attack is now launched by Dutch teammates Rux and Turnisse. They quickly pull away, causing Fignon in the lead here to take up the chase ahead of the Americans, Hampston and Le Monde. Also in this group are the Mexican Alcala, the Spaniards Marina Lajaleta and Alvaro Pino, Gianna Bugno of Italy and the French champion Eric Caratou. Every man is now digging into his physical reserves. are still together when they approach the final mile. Delgado is in the lead. He's annoyed at an over-enthusiastic fan and angrily accelerates. Further back, Fignon continues to lead. While Delgado charges towards what he thinks will be a magnificent victory. That would be a powerful reply to all his 1988 critics. Motte has been dropped, but Miller inches his way back to Delgado. 
And now you see why Miller's known as the man of the Pyrenees. Still more than three minutes behind, Fignon continues to push the pace at the front of the next group. While the battle up front continues in earnest, as Pedro Delgado responds to the flags from northern Spain. the finish is in sight. Delgado and Miller both start the sprint. And remarkably, it's the 30 years old Scott who starts to pull away and win what has been a superlative stage. This is the third time that Miller has won a tour stage in these mountains and this was certainly the best. Motte comes in 19 seconds behind and he will move into third place overall. Back in the group, the battle for the yellow jersey is at its height. Fignon, lurking at the back, suddenly surges past the other four men. Alcala, Hampson and Caritou only watch, but Le Mans summons up energy from somewhere, and slowly he overhauls Fignon. It's proving an epic battle in the Pyrenees. Le Monde catches his prey, but he seems to be struggling. Overnight, these two riders are separated by just five seconds. It is still possible for Laurent Fignon to take the leader's yellow jersey away from the American Greg Le Monde. Fignon continues keeping the pressure on. And with the finish almost in sight, that pressure is just too much for Greg Lamond. Lamond is joined by Andy Hampston and Raoul Alcala. But Fignon has gone and crosses the finishing line to reclaim the Tour's yellow jersey that he last earned five years before. After the mountains battle, stage 11 is expected now to be much quieter. The Pyrenees are gone and the race moves on from Luchon, a stage of 97 miles. But shortly after the race left Luchon, the pace picks up again and several men will be dropped, including last year's third place Tour finisher, Fabio Parra who suffers from a fever and quits the race. The speed is relentless and over 60 miles are covered in the last two hours. In the final mile, the Belgian Rudy Don is 50 yards clear. But his rear tyre rolls off and the pack races by him. The tragedy of the Tour de France can all be felt in the heart of Rudy. The sprint is led out by Canada's Bauer, but the Dutchman, Mathieu Hermans, comes through to win the stage from Giovanni Fidenza of Italy. On a day of 110 degree temperatures, the long stage from ancient Toulouse should finally give the riders some relaxation. But on the 150 miles route to Montpellier, there is a strong, favorable breeze blowing. An early break is made by Valerio Tabaldi of Italy and Dominique Arnaud of France. They're joined by another Italian, Giancarlo Perini, but again there are several crashes in the pack and 30 riders need treatment for injuries. In front, even Arnaud falls. And after five hours at the front, the two Italians fight out the finish in Montpellier. 
and in a close finish. The 24 years old Tobaldi proves the faster. He also won a stage in the 1988 Tour. Another four riders drop out of the race, making a total of 42 who've quit since the start in Luxembourg 13 days ago. And today, July the 14th, marks the bicentennial of the French Revolution. It's expected to be a day favourable to the home riders. After 45 miles, the race crosses the River Rhone. But the pace itself doesn't pick up until the pack starts to head south. The strong wind is now at their backs. Suddenly, there's an attack by race leader Laurent Fignon and third place Motte. They gain 50 seconds in an amazing move. Delgado and Le Mans lead the chase for 25 miles. And the leaders regroup 16 miles before the finish, which is in Marseille. But in warm, sunny conditions, the pace is always hot as well. The citizens of Marseille are celebrating their Bastille Day in the traditional manner. And appropriately, the news from the race is an attack by a French rider, Vincent Barteau, one of Fignon's teammates. He breaks clear on the final hill. He then cruises into the old port at Marseille, a minute ahead of the pack, to score a sympathetic victory. Bartow's stage win enlivens the bicentennial celebrations, which continue long into the night. This long 14th stage up into the foothills of the Alps takes place on another hot day. The early pace is not surprisingly slow. And a break by former mounting king Herrera with Frenchman Marc Madio and Jérôme Simon is allowed to gain six minutes. But the pack chases them down before the finishing gap. Where, in the final mile, stage four winner Yella Nydam bursts into the lead and scores another solo success just two seconds ahead of the rest. And there's another yellow jersey for Laurent Fignon. But his lead is in definite danger on the 24 miles mountain time trial up to Merlet. This is a big day for Delgado, and as he sets out on his time trial, he thinks about the remaining 2 minutes and 53 seconds that separate him from the yellow jersey. After two miles on flat roads, Delgado starts the course's first climb. It's four miles long. This challenging course seems to be built for the Spaniard. Following this initial climb and descent, there's 10 miles of flat before a five mile haul to the Melette finish. Also emerging as a contender is another Spanish veteran, Marino Lajareta, who is destined to take second place today. Fastest of all is Stephen Rooks, the 1989 runner-up, who is slowly climbing his way back into contention. He records the best time yet. It's one hour, 10 minutes and 42 seconds. Another contender is Charlie Motte, trying perhaps too hard and is heading for only 14th place. In contrast, Kelly is having a super day and will come in sixth, only 17 seconds behind Delgado.
But of course, the main focus is on Greg LeMond, who is still only seven seconds behind Laurent Fignon on overall time. The French race leader is well aware of his vulnerability as well. Le Mans starts impressively. He has again fitted the aero handlebars, planning to use them on the flat section between the course's two climbs. The American knows he's within a few seconds of Delgado's time, and he sprints in with a time just eight seconds slower than the Spaniard. Meanwhile, Fignon isn't looking comfortable at all on the climbs. His style is ungainly, and although he's faster than Motte, 10th place, 47 seconds slower than Le Monde, is worse than Fignon feared. So, the yellow jersey is back on the American shoulders. Staying in the Alps, the first of four mountain stages set out from Gap. At the start, Greg Le Monde strikes up a conversation with former teammate Andy Hampston. But there's no time for chatting in this speeding line of riders as they cross the Serponson Reservoir. The breakaways begin and 18 riders gain six minutes before the first mountain pass, the Col de Var. Swiss champion Richard in the blue is Bruno Cornier of France and they split from the league group. They quickly gain time on the others as they tackle the seven miles of climbing. The pace in the main pack is steady on the approach to the VAR. Richard, the Swiss champion, and Cornier still maintain a six minutes lead. While behind, Greg Lamond has a flat tyre. He's given a wheel by his teammate, Eddie Plankett. Quickly, the yellow jersey moves back towards the peloton. As the leaders approach the 7,000 feet summit, it's Cornier who sets the pace. Behind, there's a counter-attack being launched by Alcala. Le Monde on the right, Delgado, Ternisa, Lajaretta and Hampston are also here. The name missing, Laurent Fignon. The Frenchman is desperately leading a chase group and he's not receiving any help from Alcala's PDM teammates, Rooks and Kelly. Cornier is the best place to the two leaders, although his 18 minutes deficit makes him no threat to the race overall. He sprints ahead and takes the mountain prize. Behind, Miller has managed to join the Alcala counter-attack, but where is the Fignon group? Here they come, led by Fignon, just about 30 seconds back. It's a serious situation for Fignon, but luckily for him, his teammate Thierry Marie has dropped back from the original breakaway group to help his leader close the gap on the descent. Meanwhile, the focus returns to the leaders. And after Fignon rejoins Le Monde, Richard and Cornier head through the feed zone at Guiest. They again stretch their lead to more than six minutes. The wind remains favorable in the gorge approaching the day's main obstacle, the mighty Col d'Isoire. 
Approaching the village of Avieux, six miles from the summit, the main pack has reformed. In front, on the steepest part of the twisting climb, Richard rides away from Cornier. And he won't look round until the finish line in Briançon. It's still 16 miles away. The Col d'Isoire is a legend in tour history. Everybody would like to lead here. The huge crowds always flock to see the action on the Isoire, which has seen some legendary battles in previous tours. It's the mountain where two past champions are remembered, Fausto Coppi and Lewis and Bobet. Cornet is steadily losing ground on Richard, but he's in no danger of being caught by the small chase group being led by Motte, Ternisa, and in yellow, Greg Lamond. Delgado makes his expected attack, still trying to make up his 2 minutes 48 seconds deficit on the race lead. But the yellow jersey is still in control of this particular situation. The action behind has meant that Richard's lead has been cut to only five minutes. And his time now to bask in the glory of his energetic breakaway as he approaches the 7,700 foot summit. Vignon is again struggling, and only Le Monde, Motte and Ternisa have caught up with Delgado. Just before the top, Charlie Motte sprints ahead. And he continues his effort to attack the long technical descent on his own while Fignon desperately tries to close his 10 seconds deficit on Greg Lamond. The Swiss champion is already down the steepest part of the descent, just the finish to come. And behind, Lamond links up with Charlie Motte in an opportunist attack to beat Fignon. They career around the corners at over 50 miles an hour, inching their way clear of Delgado and the rest. But the French ace, Laurent Fignon, simply won't give up. The finish in Briançon is up a viciously steep climb, which proves no problem for the runaway Richard. But for Laurent Fignon, well, he's still in desperate trouble in pursuit of the other leaders. Richard wins the stage with a lead of over two minutes on Bruno Cornier, who didn't get caught by the field. While the leaders take their battle to the finishing hill as well, Motte and Lamont have been recaught by Delgado, Ternis, Rux and Marshal Gaillon of France. But Fignon still can't quite make contact. Fignon is just behind. A few valuable seconds being conceded. It's Charlie Motte who sprints away for third place on the stage ahead of Greg Lamond. And the seconds tick by until in fact 13 will have passed before Laurent Fignon comes across the line. And who was to know how valuable those few seconds might be? Greg Lamond was now 53 seconds in front of the Frenchman, and once more, a memorable battle had been produced at the Citadel of Briançon.
On stage 17, the most demanding stage of the tour, crossing the 8,700-foot Col de Galibier and the 6,800-foot Croix de Fer. It's a notorious climb to the finish at Alp d'Huez, and consequently, there was no hurry to begin with. The first climb on the menu, as always, the Col de Galibier. Close to the summit of the Col de Galibier stands a stone monument dedicated to Henri de Grange, the founder of the Tour de France in 1903. Delgado knows that this stage is his final chance to make up time on Le Monde and Fignon. So, to ensure that his rivals don't have an easy day, his teammates Garospe and Rodriguez Magro set a strong tempo. But Le Monde is looking secure in his yellow jersey. A sudden acceleration by the Frenchman Laurent Biondi is of secondary interest. Even when a chase is started by Ternisa and the Italian Franco Vona. Waiting anxiously at the roadside is Cathy Le Monde. She can barely believe that her husband is leading the Tour de France only a month after he'd spoken of quitting the sport. Up at the Glibier summit, the highest point of the 1989 Tour, Ternisa shows just why he's wearing the King of the Mountains polka dot leader's jersey. Ternisa is followed over the summit 15 seconds later by this group, which included Rooks and Robert Miller. Ternisa is first into the long, twisting descent. But some riders can't control their speed, such as this French rider, Gilles Saunders. He's lucky that his crash isn't more serious. Ternisa has been rejoined by Vona and Biondi and continues the top speed plunge in their wake. After descending for 10 miles, the leaders are joined by the Australian Phil Anderson, along with yesterday's winner, Richard, and six other riders. And just ahead of them all, Bona heads off on a solo spin. But Ternisa and company are just behind as they start the second part of the 30 miles descent. They catch the Italian in the valley, and there are now 11 riders in the front, a minute ahead of the main pack.
Into a strong headwind, the pack, led here by some of Le Mans ADR teammates, are heading now towards the Croix de Fer climb. Hidden away in the centre of the pack is the yellow jersey of Greg Lamond. He's ridden these roads before when he won the 1986 Tour, but he still checks out the details on his race map. The 11 leaders reach the feed zone at Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne, one minute 15 seconds ahead of the field. And with only one feed zone in this five-hour stage, it's particularly important not to miss your food bag. But race leader Greg Lamont does just that. No wonder he's angry. The Croix de Fer climb, 16 miles long, starts right after the feed zone, and Ternisa is soon forcing the pace. Only Richard, Colombian Alberto Camardo, and the Spaniard Anselmo Fuerte can stay with him. While Le Monde and Delgado's team climbing at an even pace, only 20 or so can remain with them. Even Charlie Motte is dropped, while green jersey Kelly is delayed by a puncture. Because of the constant pressure, the breakaway group can never gain more than 90 seconds. Ternisa is relentless in his attack. And 10 miles from the summit, the Dutchman rides away from Richard and Fuerte. He's facing 43 miles before the finish line. And of course, Alp Duez. The yellow jersey group continues to be led by Delgado's Reynolds team. Now in glorious isolation, the Dutch king of the mountains shows off his white and red leader's jersey to his newly won public. They call him the Wizard of Oss because he comes from the town of Oss in Holland. Others call him Hiawatha because of his flowing locks. The pace is still steady in the chase group behind, always under the policing of the Reynolds team. And Charlie Motte on the left here, who is in charge in the Pyrenees, is now receiving help from his teammate Caritou in the trickle of Jersey. While Kelly, is still catching up from his puncture. By the narrow summit of the Croix de Fer, Ternisa shows no signs of weakening. Yeah. 
And he starts yet another long descent with a lead of 1 minute 27 seconds over the Le Mans group. Motte and Kelly manage to rejoin just before the top where Miller spins for the King of the Mountains points ahead of Fignon, Rooks, Le Mans, Alcala and Delgado. With his long limbs and hair, Ternice is not the most aerodynamically shaped cyclist, but his determined style sees him increase his lead on this rapid descent. After 17 miles of descent, often at speeds over 60 miles an hour, Ternisa is just over two minutes ahead of a group led by Robert Miller and three and a half minutes ahead of the Le Mans group. If the 26 years old Ternisa could maintain this lead to the finish, he would climb into the top five of the tour. But he had yet to survive the Alp. A sign at the bottom of the Alpe d'Huez mountain road signals the first of 21 switchback turns that will lift the racers through 3,700 vertical feet in just eight miles. Over half a million fans are waiting on the mountainside. And Ternisse is aware that roughly half of those fans are from his native Netherlands. The Dutch have a great reputation on this climb. Ternisse focuses on the climb, only 13 kilometers, eight miles to go. Four minutes back of Ternisse, Fignon throws down the challenge with a surprise early attack, and Le Monde is the first to react. Delgado, who'd expected to be dictating the tactics, is the next to take up the chase. He's quickly followed by Raul Alcala. Alcala and Delgado join forces, and for the next five minutes they pursue the two race leaders. This now is a psychological battle as well as a physical one. With several minutes in hand, Turnis is able to climb at a much steadier rate. He's already been out front now for more than three hours, and the cheers of the crowd give him the extra boost he needs. There has been a slight lull in the chase and Rux and La Jareta are slowly catching back. They close in on Alcala at the back here and Delgado just in front, Le Monde and Fignon. Two great climbers come back into the race. Ternisse is now aware of the active chase behind him, knowing that Fignon's group is only three turns below. Le Mans decides to put in an attack, testing his rival's strength. But Fignon is still feeling strong. Besides the steep grade and the distance, Ternisse is also fighting a battle against the heat of a 90-degree day. Again, the pace has momentarily slowed in the group, and Delgado's Colombian teammate, Abelardo Rondon, links up. 
Rondon immediately increased the tempo with Delgado on his wheel. The others respond, but one by one, Alcala, Rux and La Hreta are shed from the group. And only four men remain together, Rondon, Delgado, Le Monde and Fignon. Only two men remain in front of these chasers, the leader, Ternisa, and Robert Miller, the only survivor of the very early counter-attack. The chasers pass under the four kilometers to go banner. From the back, Fignon notices that Le Monde's head is rolling and immediately attacks. Fignon's move stuns his three companions. But just as they catch Robert Miller, it's Pedro Delgado who eventually takes up the pace. Le Monde and Rondon are unable to follow. Miller is one who has thrown everything into the attack and now he's paying for it. Le Monde has tried at least to keep Delgado in sight but he too is paying for it now as Rondon comes alongside him. Delgado is still chasing Fignon and whoever wins this tremendous duel may also win the Tour de France. Ternisa is still riding towards the summit with great strength. His advantage, almost two minutes ahead of Finma. While Le Monde is now alone, fighting a personal battle against fatigue, he knows that he could even lose the Tour de France itself if he doesn't dig deeper into his reserves. With just over a mile remaining, Delgado finally catches Laurent Fignon, but there's no let-up in their speed. They hear that the Monde is already 52 seconds behind them. Le Monde has now passed the last of those 21 turns, and as he heads into Alp d'Huez town, he's moving easier. At the other end of town, Turnisa makes the final turn and heads up towards the finish line. Just 300 yards to go. Ternisa's marvellous adventure has ended in success. The sixth Dutch cyclist to win a tour stage at Alp d'Huez. Farther back, the battle for the yellow jersey is still being waged, with Fignon and Delgado racing as hard as they can to take the jersey from Le Mans. And here's Le Mans. He seems to be getting his second win, but can he save his yellow jersey? At the final turn, Fignon and Delgado are still locked together, a minute back of Ternisa. And Le Monde is going faster in his desperate pursuit. The sprint for second place goes to Pedro Delgado, and then the countdown begins.
begins for Greg LeMond. His two most dangerous rivals are home. Seconds now mean exactly that. Greg LeMond started the day 53 seconds ahead of Fignon, and he's already a minute behind him as he puts everything into his final effort. He crosses the line in fifth place, one minute, 19 seconds behind Fignon. Another sensational stage has ended. And the result is that once again, Laurent Fignon is back in the lead of the Tour de France. This is the third time he's taken the yellow jersey in his career. The last two times he went on to win the Tour, and they were both achieved here at Alpe d'Huez. <laughs> Today, nothing much is expected from this short 18th stage, especially after the sensation of Alpe d'Huez. It's the Colombian National Day, and maybe the celebrating Colombian cyclists will find some success. And predictably, the stage spins into life when Colombian national hero Lucho Herrera attacks 20 miles from the finish. Once again, as a potential tour winner, Herrera's had a poor race. He's almost 30 minutes behind on overall time, but now, three minutes from the top of the San Nizier Hill, he's 42 seconds ahead of the pack. When the incredible Laurent Fignon launches another surprise attack, the yellow jersey is going away from the other leaders. He wants to increase his overall 26 seconds lead over Le Monde. Fignon is soon up to Herrera and races straight by the little Colombian. There is panic behind as Le Monde, Delgado and the rest are starting to chase. They can see the yellow jersey just in front. The sudden acceleration strings out the pack and the back markers will concede 10 minutes or more by the finish. Delgado and Ternisa pull clear of Lucho Herrera. A battle to limit the escape of Laurent Fignon and the 15 seconds behind him as he nears the top of the climb with only 13 miles to go. It's not a big lead, but when Delgado eases back from the front, the other three also relax. For a while, no one will chase down Fignon. They could be allowing the tour to go through their fingers, and so Delgado reluctantly takes up the chase again. Alcala, Rooks, Kelly, and a few others have regrouped behind them. They're now too far back, and the race is remaining a battle between the Le Mans trio. And they too have the hands full. The French hero is now 35 seconds ahead, and there's only seven miles to go. It looks as though Fignon is putting the yellow jersey totally out of reach. But Alcala's group is now closing fast.
but when they catch the three chasers, Fignon's lead has leapt to 52 seconds. Only two miles remain, and it's all uphill to the finishing line. Fignon is fighting hard, but he's taken a lot out of himself. And now Rux is really starting to move too, pulling the chasers closer and closer. Fignon has clinched the stage and is delighted with his performance. But how much time has he taken from Greg LeMond? All eyes turn to the final bend, and here comes Rux and Ternisa with LeMond tucked in behind. LeMond will lose 24 seconds and Delgado a few seconds more. Everyone says the tour is over, that Fignon's new lead of 50 seconds is too much for LeMond to make up in the final three stages. Stage 19 is the first of these and it contains the last three climbs of the 1989 tour. And it all begins with a long downhill. But the easy part is soon over, and the tough Calder Port climb looms over Grenoble. The yellow jersey seems to have inspired Fignon, and he's again on the rampage. And by the midpoint of the severe 10 miles climb, only four riders are left in his wake. La Jareta, Delgado, Ternisa, and Greg Lamont. By the top, the five leaders have a lead of 90 seconds. It seems now that Fignon is unstoppable, and he launches another attack on the first slopes of the Col du Coucheron. He gains 150 yards. But the world's finest climbers just behind him hadn't given up hope yet. They persist in their chase, and they rejoin the yellow jersey. Calm is restored, and the top five men in the race continue to pull away from the rest. They're three minutes ahead when they crest this tour's final mountain, the Col de Grenier. Le Mans then tries to break clear on the sweeping descent, but Fignon is too alert for that one. The five are still together in the street of Chambéry when they nearly all fall down at badly positioned traffic islands. But there's no real damage done and together they head for the finish beside the lake at Aix-les-Bains. While Le Mans sits neatly in behind the yellow jersey, La Jareta leads out the sprint, but the Spaniard is quickly overhauled, and the delighted Greg Le Mans powers his way to the line for the stage win. It's a great morale booster for the American, who even suggests he might make up his 50 seconds deficit in Paris. But before the final time trial, there's this one final chance for the sprinters to find some glory. Like the rest of the 138 survivors, Fignon is happy that the end of the tour is near. And they're ready for some fun on this completely flat penultimate stage. Anderson makes a bid for victory five miles from the finish, putting everything into his one attack. But after a mile of freedom, he will be caught. The sprinters have waited for a week for this flat terrain, and the young Italian Giovanni Verdanza makes a last desperate thrust to take victory. It seems that Fignon's crown is safe for the final showdown in Paris, which is reached by a 300 miles ride on the TGV Express. Le Monde relaxes on the two hour trip, while Delgado gives an interview. And on their arrival in Paris, 
Vignon gets upset when pursued by a TV news team. Perhaps Fignon is nervous about this final time trial, but it seems designed to give him a triumph into his hometown. But maybe history will repeat itself. It was 200 years ago during the French Revolution that King Louis XVI was removed from his home, the gigantic palace of Versailles. The king was taken to Paris and was executed three years later. Is King Fignon also going to lose his crown? And the only man who can do it is Greg Lamond, and he certainly looks confident at the start in Versailles. If anything, Fignon seems overconfident. The ponytail Parisien can't even consider losing 50 seconds in 15 miles. For Delgado, the stage is a formality. He knows that he won't make two and a half minutes up on Fignon, but he's proud that he's proven himself. To come back from 198th place in Luxembourg to third in Paris has been a remarkable achievement. But Le Mans still has a one in 100 chance of winning this tour. He's riding his aerodynamic bike, wearing his aero helmet, and using his narrow aero handlebars. And he says he feels strong. The timekeeper counts down the seconds. And Le Monde is away on this ultimate trip. Two minutes after his American rival, Laurent Fignon enters the starting house. He too has his aero bike, but no aero helmet and no aero bars. The countdown begins. And now Fignon is underway for this 27 minute ride to destiny. Le Monde is a pure picture of power, approaching 40 miles an hour on this opening stretch. On reaching the River Seine at six miles, Fignon is 18 seconds behind Le Monde, a loss of three seconds per mile. At this rate, he'll lose the stage by 45 seconds, but win the tour by five. Le Monde is relentless in his challenge, smoothly turning his biggest gear. Fignon, in contrast, is more erratic. He stands on his pedals in search of extra power, but he only breaks his rhythm. He's down 37 seconds, only 13 seconds left in hand, 4.7 miles to ride. Cathy Lamont can't believe that the impossible is coming true. But there's her husband, Greg. He's thundering down the Champs-Élysées, about to catch Delgado for two minutes. Greg Lamont's time trial is over, a time of 26 minutes, 57 seconds, a record speed of 34 miles an hour. Kathy and her father-in-law gasp in astonishment. Greg Lamont celebrates in anticipation with his coach, Otto Giacome. And there is Fignon. Can he still hang on to his crown? He's across the line and the clock shows a time of 27 minutes 55. He's 58 seconds slower than the Mon. Fignon has lost the Tour de France by eight seconds, the smallest margin in the history of the Tour. There's only pain and sorrow for Laurent Fignon. And tears and joy for Greg Lamont.
illusion for France and delight for America. Fignon is shattered by his defeat, but he will live to fight another tour. Le Monde is rejuvenated by his win. He says, this was the hardest race of my career, but the happiest day of my life. On the victory podium, the American tells his French rival, now we've both won two tours. We'll see next year who can win the third.